is happiness still within our reach? Can there be a full life in an empty generation? Hi, I'm Pastor Bill with your Maple Minute for this Tuesday, December the 8th, 2020. Poet John Berryman, he achieved elite status as a poet, even claiming a Nobel Prize for some of his poetry. He had widespread acclaim, fame, friends, and followers. But one frozen January day in 1972, Berryman walked across the bridge in Minnesota, waved to a stranger, and leaped to his death in the icy Mississippi River. Why? Well, as he said in his own words, at 55, half famous and effective, I still feel rotten about myself. In one of his other poems, he wrote, After all has been said, and all has been said, man is a huddle of need. But in a survey of almost 8,000 students at 48 different colleges, uh, they asked them what they considered very important to them. And the study reported some strange things, things that we wouldn't think to be true. The, the report said that only 16% of those who answered said that making money was the most important thing. But 75% said that their first goal in life was finding a purpose and meaning to it. Psycho psychologist Carl Jung, in one of his books, he wrote, about a third of my cases are suffering from no clinically definable neurosis, but from the senselessness and the emptiness of their lives. This can be described as the general neurosis of our time. And I think that that's a true summation that we do have a little bit of lacking of hope or pers uh, personal uh, happiness in our life. But I will say this, Within every single one of us lies an intense desire to understand the why of our existence. And I think that's something God placed within us. It's one of those things that causes us to want to find out who our creator was and why am I here. And by the way, it's one of the easiest ways to talk to people about their purpose in life and lead them into a relationship with Jesus Christ. It really is. Uh, <clears throat> a copy of an anonymous suicide note from a college student said this. To anyone in the world who cares, who am I? Why am I living? Life has become stupid and purposeless. Nothing makes sense anymore. The questions I had when I came to college are still unanswered, and now I'm convinced there are no answers. There can only be pain and guilt and despair here in this world. My fear of death and the unknown is far less terrifying than the prospect of the unbearable frustration, futility, and hopelessness of continued existence. That's so sad. But I want you to know, that's not a new sentiment. That kind of sentiment has been going on for since the existence of man, really. None of this is new. See, we can't even feel a single shred of emotion that hasn't already been felt a million times over by people who've uh, lived years before us. The wisest of the wise have shared fully in our sorrowful cry and search for happiness, including the wisest of them all, a guy that we would call Solomon. He was the son of David. He was the king. And successful though he was, wealthy, extravagantly wealthy, let me say that, uh, though he was, surrounded by great men and beautiful wives and concubines, though he was, and exceedingly blessed by God with both riches and wisdom, Solomon still felt that all, felt all that you and I felt today. Solomon still felt that emptiness and sometimes that, that lack of happiness in our lives, that can I still feel happiness within my reach. How wonderful it would be if we could pronounce a happily ever after ending on Solomon's life and, and his kingdom, but that's not to be true. It wasn't for the man, it wasn't for the nation. Solomon's vast wealth, uh, which, which is still remarkable today, his fame and especially his sensual appetite tainted his special standing before God. That seemed to taint his life, too. See, wealth, power, and pleasure can be dangerous even in the hands of the wisest man, and that's important for us to understand. These things long not to be mastered, but to master us, and that's the problem. Solomon compromised himself before the Lord who had given him enough foresight to know better, and that's why Solomon writes this book of despair. The drifting came slowly, deceptively, but further, the further he moved from God, the greater became his emptiness, his frustration, and his confusion in life. He had that experience so many today are finding a life without God doesn't really have much purpose, does it? In the evening of his life, 
<clears throat> Solomon wrote the book of Ecclesiastes, which was a regretful retrospective on life itself. In the delusion, uh, delusion autumn of his year, Solomon revisited the wreckage of a wasted life. And yet we still think of all the accomplishments that Solomon made in his writings. He made one final stab at, uh, stab at redemption, though, an attempt to block others from his own perilous downhill road of destruction. And that's what we find in the book of Ecclesiastes. And so in the next several weeks, probably, uh, we're going to take a, a time to go through the book of Ecclesiastes and we're going to study and answer the question, is happiness still within our reach? Can we be happy? And should we be happy? You know, Solomon begins his book uh, with a really a conclusion. In the first three verses, as he writes the, the introduction to this book, he says, The words of the preacher, the son of David, king of Jerusalem, Vanity of vanities, says the preacher, vanity of vanities. All is vanity. What does a man gain by all the toil at which he toils under the sun? You know, uh, immediately we come across this word vanity, which we don't use as often. Uh, it's, it's, sometimes it's even used in positive ways in our generation, which is crazy to me. But it is a word that expresses some, some uh, uh, insight. See, today we're connected, uh, we connect vanity and egotism. Uh, we connect it to a man or woman who is overly self-involved. But I want you to know this. Vanity is always based on an illusion, and that's really what Solomon's trying to point out to us. Vanity, it's like trying to, uh, as one preacher I, I heard one time, it's like trying to um, remember a dream after you've woken up suddenly. Isn't it hard to remember dreams? Most of the dreams we dream, we don't remember. Only a very few. And it's so hard because sometimes they're good dreams and you want to go back to sleep, but you can't. That's vanity, isn't it? It's like trying to catch the wind is one of the illustrations that Solomon will use later on. As Solomon uses the word here, he refers to emptiness is, is what he's talking about in his vanity of vanities. Emptiness, to that which is transitory in meaning. Uh, it has very little meaning is what he's trying to get across. In this case, vanity is similar to a vapor that lasts only a minute before it quickly vanishes, leaving nothing behind. Imagine getting only to the top to find that it's all smoke, it's all uh, illusion, it's all vapor, it's nothingness, it's emptiness. Solomon's repetition of the word vanity um, was a Hebrew uh, poetic device that intensified the meaning here as he repeated it. He says, vanity, uh, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Life is, really what he's saying, life is utterly, absolutely, totally meaningless. <laughs> now, before you despair, we're going to come to a conclusion that doesn't leave us hopeless. But you're going to have to stay with us in this maple minute as we go through this road and the path to happiness. See, life, as we know it, just turn on the news, Life in and of itself is emptiness. It is vanity. It's purposeless without God. And that's the, the whole point that he is really trying to make. Because he's observing life in all the efforts of man without God. See, dreams come true, but they don't come free, do they? And as part of the price is realizing that elusive joy has escaped our clutches. And deep within the quiet of our soul, something suggests that one more time, we have looked in the wrong place, and that's what Solomon's point was. Looking in the wrong place doesn't get us to a good place. So I encourage you in the next several uh, maple minutes, and, and this probably will go on because we are going to go through the entire book of Ecclesiastes, join us as we search with Solomon on his road to happiness and see what he discovers because he's going to give us a lot of good truths in how we can live our lives, truths that are so important to us. But I would encourage you in this. Don't base your existence on happiness. Give yourself some purpose, the purpose that the Creator gave you. See, God gives us hope, and that's what's great. As we talked about on Sunday, Galatians chapter 4, God sent His Son to give us hope, and that's what Christmas is all about. This may not have been the most encouraging of, of episodes, but it is true. There is, a, there is a generation of people out there that are committing suicide, that are uh, not knowing how to handle life. Old people, young people, and this is the time of year that more people will end their lives than ever. Why? Because they find no hope. Because they're looking for it in all the wrong places. So I would encourage you, if you're a Christ follower, give people the hope of Christmas this season. Don't give them gifts. Give them the greatest gift. Give them Jesus. Help point them. Ask them what their purpose in life is all about. Ask them what their why is. Because remember, 
Within every single one of us lies an intense desire to understand the why of our existence, and that is so important. So until next time, why don't you help someone find their path to happiness by turning them towards God?